questions or comments, um, if I can move the recommendation in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. Item number 11 now I know is a real priority for all members um, on the committee as we uh, deal with young person and student transport tasks charter that's been developed. Now we've got um, Liz and Carol are going to present this book, but more importantly, I think we've got a presentation from uh, Benjamin McGowan from the Liverpool Youth Parliament and Dan Cole, who's the Vice President from Liverpool John Moores University of Student Students. So, if I can hand over to you yourselves uh, to present the report. Thank you. Just as, as Ben's walking up, just to give a bit of background to members, um, you recall back in January 2014, uh, Liverpool City Region bus operators and mayors of travel um, and train operators signed a pledge around young people uh, and listening to them uh, in terms of the, the customer offer. Uh, and we've obviously been doing a range of work. Um, since then, we've got to a stage where we felt it was very important to actually just pause and reflect and ask again to. Um, that represent young people, but also students, what their real wants and needs are. Um, what we've got today is um, representatives of obviously the Students' Union and the Youth Parliament to actually share that with us. I'll just pass briefly to Carol, and it's been a bit of a chance that's been important. And yeah, the reports um, ask us to endorse two charters, uh, the Young Persons Charter and the Students Charter, um, and really make sure that we consider that both what's being asked to both charters. Most of the global local authorities and key stakeholders and the wider transport sector, but also that we uh, as officers reduce the response to both masks as well. Um, young people across Merseyside are very dependent on the transport to access opportunities. Um, there are nearly 300,000 young people uh, across Merseyside. 27% who have uh, no car in their household, so they're wholly dependent on walking, cycling, or public transport to get access to the opportunities that they need to access. On top of that, um, a number of households as well that have no adults who are working or in low income households, so affordability is an additional uh, issue for those young people to access opportunities. Two and a half million, uh, 20 and a half million bus journeys are made by children from the age of 16 every single year, and 3.1 million uh, train journeys from the age of 16, so significant amounts of travel that being made. Young people are transport users as well, unless we provide them with services that they want, that they like, they're not going to choose when they're older they are, one can't they have to, to continue to use public transport network, put money into that network and then keep the network running that much longer. So what we've done is we've worked really hard with young people and students uh, to develop these charters. Uh, it's very much been their voices, um, not our voices as officers, been their voices that we've summed up um, and that's why we really, that was important that Ben and Dan came to present it just to, to highlight some of the aspects Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as you can see, I'm Mayor Benji and I'm from the Liverpool Schools Parliament. I'm also sitting on the uh, Home School Transport Review, review Panel within the Liverpool City Council. I'm going to talk about the young persons uh, asks for uh, transport in the in, in Liverpool City region. The first one is using technology. Um, a lot of young people don't you know, have smartphones. If we could use that to win the advantage, use it to our advantage there, you know, this one for news, when we could win that to their advantage, as our advantage, we could expand the, um, well, the sort of use of my, my ticket and uh, the weekly, you know, sort of weekly trio, so uh, etc. Also, using the more card now, I know that are not very accessible at the moment because we're still rolling the system out, but you, um, a lot of the complaints that I received from when I was doing the uh, the transport, the panels and all that, um, was that things were getting lost because on a scrappy piece of paper. And you can get pushed down in front of it in the pocket, you can get lumped up in the purse or sort of wallet, or and they can pull out, they haven't got a ticket anyway, they have to pay again to go on the bus. And they're using, using options that are more compact and easy to you know, mess around with a bit. It would really uh, assist in getting more people onto the buses and Second one is a bit more of a flexible zone structure. You know, we all have the zone C1 and zone C2 and all that. It, it sometimes gets a bit confusing. You don't know really where you, where you need, and you could end up paying a bit more than you need. 
for some way you're actually never going to go. And also the time restrictions. The same boys, they're good, they're good value at the moment, but they're doing off peak tickets during weekdays, and especially during school holidays, they're not classed as uh, a bank holiday event, like, so no restrictions would apply. Now, a lot of my people, when people my age, they go out quite late at night, they'll be out until you know, 8, 9, 10, I think, and they'll be up at 7, because they want to be at that, whatever they're going, whatever concert they're going to, or whatever, have a really early time, you know, whatever they're doing, and they're having to pay the single fare to go on a peak time service, maybe on a bus or a train, even using wherever they could be. So including a, a more flexible service instead of having zone, so having multiple zones, just have like city zone and uh, out zone and north, north zone and etc. And also fair and fair options. It's weird to go one stop on a bus it's one pound forty, to go ten stop on a bus it's one pound forty. It's a flat flat rate. You're not really you know you're not really paying for the service that you're being given. You're being given one stop. Where's that one pound forty gone? You're giving ten stops. Yeah, one pound forty. You have got your money away. You got the fuel and all that. What? Well, how much fuel is actually going to cost you for one for one uh, one stop? Also, using the fair and fair options. I know we've heard we recently introduced the my tickets. Uh, I hear they are in fact a success, and I'm, and I'm I'm really happy to hear that the bus companies are really uh, accepting it well and having it into their um, sort of scheme of business. is more information on bus timetables. They're, they're quite, quite simple to read. I, 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 have to, I really have to admit that they're quite simple to read. But having more of the uh, information, to, I don't mean, know where that we have, I mean, we have them on the city, but the electronic screens in the, uh, in the side of the, on the top of the bus. Table. Some of us you know, don't have a watch, we don't carry a watch and carry our phones out in the dead. We could be sitting there for hours, sitting there for a good while, checking if the bus is there or not. So having them screens would really assist in, you know, having the time of them be able to look at it in the long run. Support schools and colleges within uh, the sort of the transport sector. Maybe you know, getting the word out there about my ticket. I know we there was quite a big publicity push last year for my ticket and all that. But for the other services like the Trium and the Solo and whatever students students would be used. If they know that that, that that service is there, they and, and you know it's of benefit to them, they will use it as long as it is put themselves to them. And going by the schools and colleges, you're not relying on them to be looking at the poster and putting the bus stop, which is you know could be highly likely, but they've got to take absolutely no notice of it. Basically interacting with the students will you know really engage them. You know, you're not just going and sitting there blab blabbering on about some sort of ticket, how much it's gonna be and Basically interacting with them, making them a part of the process of you know, their transport needs will really uh, start to engage and have a lot more young people on the, the transport buses. I think this is a big. This is one of the big issues that the um, at the young persons focus panel. The driver away. The drivers. Some we have a few. We have a, quite a lot of complaints for, for taking young people about drivers being being, being treated badly by their drivers. You know, you'll see an old, old person on the bus, they'll be so nice to them and so kids, he's getting the whole week and you see the old person on, it's like a completely different story. It's a ugh, 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 get on, get on, get on. Dishing it out to people like, you know, you don't really want to talk to them. Showing the same attitude you show to your elders, the younger generation, would really make, you know, young children feel a lot more better traveling on. They feel, you know, you wouldn't really want to be able to go on a bus and be told, you know, oh, it's given up, it's given up to people. You wouldn't, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't really enjoy it, would you? Oh, and then going back to the driver awareness training, um, cyclists in, in having cycle awareness courses so they know how to deal with cyclists uh, on the road. Because I know that there's, I don't know which more it is, but some sort of legislation that you can really drive, you can ride a bicycle on the road. And it can, can be quite unnerving to some people because there's, you know, giant double decker buses coming up next to them and they're trying to tear in. You don't know when they're actually to sort of do anything. So having the drivers aware of any 
because of the psychological situation would really benefit them. Um, and it's, it's not just proposing that it's the young people get the you know, answer by bikes and the answer, you know, the fresh air and all. Health and safety. This was also another big one of this. At the, um, you've seen a lot of bus drivers at peak times just kind of cram everyone in the bus and you're sort of hanging there and you've got some, some squashed against it. it, it it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 I know they're all about maximising the revenue, but at times where health and safety is more hard amounts to the bus companies, I think that needs to be reiterated into them. Uh, also, having a bit more of a, a bigger bus for peak time services will also be more desirable because I know the number seven, which I get from the pool to back to my home program, it's usually quite a pack service at six o'clock at night because there's only a single deck of bus and it's quite a short one as well. As I said before, the driver awareness rate and the custom service and equality, you know, going back to what I said about drivers being nurse treating you so treating you the same way as you would expect to treat them, etc. etc. Increasing CCTV to make young people feel a bit more safe in the bus, uh, bus stops or bus stations or wherever it may be. They go up, we do go up quite late at night like sometimes, and you could be sat in a dark bus station in the middle of the road where you've you, you know, you got written your means of self defence. If, if someone's physically going to try and attack you, at least being able to have it on CCTV and be able to catch the perpetrator of. But, and even trying to prevent the perpetrator from attacking them in the, in the first place. The, from using CCTV would be a really big help to young people in you know, providing safe aspects of public transport. And also, this is the best, this is one of my favorite ones. Everyone loves this. It's having a free white van on buses. We all have our smartphones and we all, you know, we're out of date certain time. I've just spent 26 pounds on data for me through me through no fault of my own. <laughs> in, in, in Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. And you, having the free, having the free Wi-Fi will help young people connect with each other and being able to have like sort so of social. I'm not saying you have to make a massive Wi-Fi party on the bus, so just having it there for young people to be able to use and to be able to, you know, sort of interact with the, with the new Wi-Fi and have a high message with it, and it saves saves them a bit of money from having to text and using all the phones and videos and all. Priority for buses on the on the roads. You've always seen buses being uh, and then with uh, the reduction of bus lanes since July, the buses have been stuck in the middle of traffic jams or you know, on, I know on, I know on that on the stretch of road outside you often get stuck up there. Going to school in the morning as well on the 81 81A route, that gets quite busy in the morning, and especially during um, the key times. Trying to get to school it takes about ten to about ten minutes with the bus lanes. No, it's about 20 because you have to move through all the uh, slow moving traffic because it does get quite busy. Um, good to see a, a, a good diverse range of students. 
Um, and then that brings us to today. So obviously um, what we've done um, is produce a transport chance, which hopefully, hopefully you've all had a chance to see. Um, basically it outlines eight of the key topics or asks uh, for students in Liverpool. So uh, this is around 50,000 university students in Liverpool. Um, we've been doing ongoing work, so the focus group was, was a big point. There's been ongoing work throughout the year. Um, a lot of our students travel to uh, the campus in particular out in Egbert, and um, particularly the first year students can't uh, get halls of residence close to their, uh, to their campus, so they have no choice but to travel. Um, so what we've been doing, um, from my point of view, I've been working on a local level with the university to ensure that we can support students as much as possible. Um, and we were able to introduce a shuttle bus last year, which um, students could take advantage of to get from the city centre from St George's Hall. Um, across to the Iron Marsh campus in Egbert, which was really well received. Um, but obviously, um, there were sustainability issues we put on the bus, and it was one of those that too many students wanted to use it, and there was not enough capacity, which was great and bad at the same time, obviously. Um, so we've changed the offer, um, well, the university have changed their offer to students, and they actually provide a travel subsidy for all first years who travel to that campus, which is in the form of a, a one hundred twenty-five pound um, check that they can claim back against their transport and we encourage them to buy the trio pass because that obviously works for uh, trains and buses so it gives a bit more flexibility. Um, but obviously that doesn't benefit all students so um, referring back to the charter um, just to highlight kind of some of the issues and a lot of these resonate with uh, what Benjamin has just written about so when they're talking about more flexible student travel pass um, I think uh, clearer ticket information regarding zones that, that came up as well. So um, the issues do really kind of spread across all young people, so young people, students, um, and for us as well at the university, we've got a lot of mature students. So uh, particularly John Moore's University, the student demographic, you'll have home students, you'll have students from North Wales, um, from all over Merseyside, students with families, uh, care leavers. So it's a real kind of mixed bag. Um, there's no typical student, there's no typical student day, so lectures aren't 9 to 5 anymore. Um, there are courses that go on until 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. Um, so I think whilst we promote the trio pass to a lot of our students, it's not actually that great in terms of the restrictions. So by 8pm, if you've had a lecture, you can't then get home. So I think it's my friend MJ for a single ticket, um, which is all extra money when you're the students that have. So, um, Obviously, students get student finance, student loans, and they don't uh, most of the time even cover their rent. Um, so we, that's the reason why a lot of our home students will commute in, but they again can't sometimes afford to travel in. So we've had students uh, creating petitions and uh, campaigning on campus because they've been making the choice to work to come in for a lecture, or whether they can they can pay for their weekly shop, which nobody should have to be making those decisions. Um, so it's really quite a pressing issue. Um, I think something, uh, to pick up on something that Carol mentioned at the start, I think it's about the culture as well. So if you can get young people and students into uh, using public transport from an early age and they have a really good experience as well, so that's a key thing as well, it has to be a good experience, they will tend to start to kind of enjoy that and use it in the future. Um, we've got data that shows a lot of our graduates stay in the Merseyside area, whether that's because they're from the Merseyside area or they've come to Merseyside and, and like it and um, get a job here. Um, and if they've had a good experience, they will continue to use um, the services that are offered um, across the region. And that, again, if they have families, they will then get their families to use it. So there's a benefit to, to all parties, really. Um, so there's that side of it. Um, I think statistics we've uh, found as well, so when we um, provided the uh, travel uh, subsidy and the shuttle box. We found that a lot of students were attending more lectures, so lecture attendance went up, uh, especially they're paying nine thousand pounds a year now. Um, I'm, I'm quite lucky when I was at university I was paying three thousand a year, but nine thousand um, pounds a year students now will actually sit and work out how much each lecture cost them um, because they're paying more money so they want to know they're getting value for money. And it's not just transport, it's the cost of their accommodation, it's the cost of catering on campus. Um, so I really have quite a tough role to try and support students financially. Um, 
but I mean, a lot of it speaks for itself in the charter, so I think a lot of it is around making sure that the, the passes are more uh, convenient, uh, better value for money. Um, payment plans is always an interesting one, it's not something I actually bought about until the students have mentioned it. So it's all well that they can, they can get a better value for money pass, but when their loan comes in in an installment at the start of the year, and they then have to pay their accommodation out that, most of them will have a few hundred pounds left, and that, that has to be, they have to budget to live for um, a couple of months with that, so they can't afford to then pay uh, 200, I think 260 pounds now for a trip pass at the start of the year, or whatever it may be, so um, there are a lot of different factors in, in an ideal world, all eight would, would happen, but um, I think it's just seeing what, what is possible in the kind of supporting the students, because students are essentially the future.
there's only plans for more options to be, uh, to be used as age you critical as you didn't say. Incentivised to do that. 
Um, it's Jewish customers, but it's sensitized and says, well, so if you've got, you've got a lot of control, well, we've got control in, in the water sky and what its abilities can be. And if it can deliver everything that the ocean is in this moment, you will get that control.
yeah, thanks for that, Stephen. I'll endorse all of that entirely. I think the whole exercise, which has been going on for quite a couple of years now, isn't it, Jones? has been really sort of useful for you, I hope, but actually has been really useful for us. And for me, it shows exactly the way the transport network should be working. It should be working on the basis of asking what customers want and then delivering that accordingly. Um, I wanted to say as well, um, fellas, that we get a lot of people coming and giving us presentations here. Genuinely, that was one of the best. I, can, I don't mind telling you much better than a reader and giving a presentation. No, no doubt about that. Um, and all the points you make are right, you know, and this is the key point that sort of Steve and Mary were making. That the asks that you're asking for, they're not demands, they're not kind of um, pie in the sky, they're actually genuine things that I think should be happening. Uh, and firmly, um, I fully endorse all the things that you ask for, and as a committee I think we all will endorse that accordingly. And one way or another, we want to see that happen. Because at the end of the day, it was the point that Dan made, which is absolutely right, that it's not just about giving you a better deal uh, for the sakes of it being the right thing to do. Actually, you're the future of the transport network. If we make sure that younger people are regular users of the transport network and get a good deal from that, you'll stick with that for the rest of your lives. And that's what we want to see for the transport network, because it's good for the network, but it's also good for sustainability and the environment. But it also, we hope that it's good for you as well. So, firmly from our perspective, we fully endorse um, what you're saying. I think it's a real shame, actually, that none of the bus companies, particularly, were able to hear you say this today and, and, and see your presentation. Because, believe you me, we continually bang on at them about all of these issues that you make, about it being too expensive, about the flat fare policy not working, about the tickets not being flexible enough about drivers not always giving the best standards of customer service that should be given to anybody. It's much more powerful when people like yourselves, representing the full pantheon of young people that you do, are saying that. And, and firmly from that perspective, not only do we endorse what you say, we're going to throw the gauntlet down to those operators and say, this is what young people want, this is what we expect operators to deliver, and they need to take that away, and have to bring that back with some options about how they're going to do because as Ron alluded to, and as Steve alluded to, there's an election coming and there could be changes with government and the powers that we have. If we get some changes in powers that mean we can do that, one way or another, we will. So, do you want to come back on that, Benjamin? Yeah, as um, Steve said, a lot of the, the, the touching base with the, with the customer base and uh, with getting in there, I think you've already done that with the, with the focus groups and the mind ticket. Touch base with a lot of us. I, I, I've been to a lot of the folks we, 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 we spoke with the team out of Leeds and Kelly. We've spoken to a lot of people and we've got a lot of information on it. So you just need, need to carry on continuing with the. Uh, we need to, well, as, as, a, as a group, we all need to continue getting that information, getting that research, and getting into the customers so they know what they want. They might take
as they have since the foundation of the welfare state, and that's not just in Britain, it's across Europe. There are over 10 million young people unemployed across Europe. There's one million young people not in education, employment, or training in the UK. And I think I'm right in saying there are about three million people in HE and FE in the UK. These are all people who tend to be on low incomes. Um, so far, we've talked about students and young people who are in education, but those needs, those one million not in education and edu education, employment and training are also part of our equation. We need to find a solution to them. I appreciate it was outside the scope of your inquiry, but I, everything that you've summed up today, and I don't wish to compromise you politically, but it sounds like you've identified what they've identified as the problems in our education. Uh, in our Hold on, Dan said he was conservative before. <laughs> he, said conserva he said conservative with a small c, um, which I think was a descri factual description rather than a political one. So I'm very much in favour of the things that you've mentioned, which you went to regulation and integration. These are things that we've been calling for, and regardless of what happens on May the 7th, we don't have Labour governments, there are elements of the current Transport Act that we would hope to use, I think. Um, coming back to the smaller stuff though, you mentioned about safety at bus shelters and transport, uh, travelling on the transport network, which I agree with. And I just wonder, a lot of the bus shelters we have have lights installed, but they're not plugged in. And I think we need to look at um, liaison with our district boroughs and see what we can do with our highway authorities to make sure that where there is a proximus electricity supply that bus shelters are lit up because you know it might be sunny tonight but in six months time it'll be pitch black at this hour and people don't stop traveling when the sun goes down so there are things that we can do and young people it doesn't matter how safe we feel as older people but young people are often the subject of aggression and violence we need to make sure that they feel safe for the reasons that we've already mentioned this organisation, even without the statutory powers that we seek as a labour movement, is a powerful organisation. We might not run or commission bus services, but we sure as hell have influence. And I think we need to be guided by our policies and not our processes. And I don't think we need to worry about our back offices. We need to think about our passengers. I think what you said about the being a bit more harsh with the asks. I think it's really a case of building the block, having it's basically a building blocks process. These are what we should, we all really expect at the moment. It's not really a time to be saying we want this, we want that. It's a time to be saying, right, this is what we need for an effective bus service for young people. Once we've got that, fabulous, we can then start expanding the access to young people. It's not really, um, right, this is, all, this is all going to happen in 10 years. It's up to what we want to happen.